Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, one and all, whatever is the most appropriate greeting forever you are in the world right now. A very warm welcome indeed to Epic's Safer Gambling Week 2023 webinar, The Evolution of Safer Gambling. I'm the Communications Manager at Epic, Adrian Ward, and I'm delighted to be joined by a stellar panel of colleagues of mine from the company from both sides of the Atlantic. Representing the UK, we've got Alan Smart and Craig Cornforth, and from our US contingent, Patrick Chester and Ryan Tatusco. We'll get each of them to introduce themselves very shortly indeed to give you a very quick pricey of their background of the experience of gambling related harm and also details of what they now currently do in terms of safer gambling for Epic. But before we do, just to remind you all, there is a Q&A function at the top of your screens. If you'd like to pitch questions to the panel, please do so. Using that, we will be able to accept the number of questions throughout the 45 minutes or so we are broadcasting for today. So you can ask us anything you want to ask about the evolution of safer gambling or indeed any of the work that we do as a company to try and mitigate gambling related harm wherever it may occur. So without too much further ado, I'll get all of my panel to unmute their mics and we can go around one by one and introduce themselves to tell you a bit more about them. So I think the first person I saw quick on the mark as ever to make sure his mic was ready for us was uh, Craig Cornforth, our harm prevention manager. So Craig, please tell us a bit more about yourself. Yeah, certainly. Good afternoon. Um, good day to everybody. Um, as Adrian said, great to see you all here. My name is Craig Cornforth. My role is a harm prevention manager within Epic Risk Management. That, that role um, means that I share my story with operators and deliver training throughout the UK and globally. I am um, six years um, in recovery since my last bet um, in gambling. Mine was mainly a sport sort of themed addiction. Um, again, as Adrian's already touched on, nothing's off the table today. The more questions, the better. Um, and we, you know, we're willing to share anything that you want us to today. Big thanks to you, Craig. We'll continue on UK theme. Alan Smart, also harm prevention manager here at Epic. Please tell us a bit about yourself, Alan. Thanks, AJ. AJ. So, yeah, my name's Alan Smart. Been with Epic now um, exactly two years this week. Uh, whatever you find, Craig, you will find me because we do the same job. Uh, we're normally together uh, delivering our lived experience. Myself, 21 year pathological gambling addiction. We work with operators um, and we train out things like our, our interactions masterclass. Uh, and yeah, um, two years uh, going strong uh, and yeah, love it. That's great to hear. Thanks, Helen. Uh, we'll go across to the very westerly coast of the United States where Patrick Chest has got up nicely to join us today. Uh, we're very just to have the UK-US perspectives are split today. So Patrick, please tell us a bit more about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Adrian, and, and good afternoon to, to everyone on here and, and, and thanks for hopping on too. Um, yeah, my name is Patrick Chester and I am over in the US and what I do is I deliver, I'm a program facilitator and so I'll go from uh, colleges, different colleges across the country, meet with student athletes, coaches, staff in an effort to raise awareness about gambling and sports betting, which is what I was. I was a 15 year uh, big time sports gambling addict. And so share a little bit about my story, my struggle, and I'm now eight years in recovery. My last bet was uh, a little over eight years ago. and I've been with Epic for about a year now, and it's an incredible team that I get a chance to work with, and so I'm grateful for the opportunity that I have. So thanks. That's a little bit about me, so thanks. That's brilliant. And to conclude our quartet, let's hear from you, Ryan, on a slightly more central US time zone. So I hope you're slightly more awake than uh, Patrick having to be right okay. today. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my name is Ryan Tatesco. Um, I work on the same team as Patrick, you know, and as was stated, we go around to universities and we talk with student athletes. Um, I myself was a collegiate student athlete. I was also a professional athlete um, for my any U.S. contingent. I was a baseball player, I guess, rounders for uh, those overseas <laughs> as, much, as much as I can uh, can say. But, you know, um, like Patrick, we we share our lived experience about you know, uh, the relationship that we had had with gambling and, you know, not only that over here is we we share with the young student athletes, um, you know, about them being aware with their relationship and that they start identifying signs of harm that, you know, they're they're capable of getting help and to encourage them to reach out for help with them if they are or if anyone in their inner circle um, they think is experiencing harm, how to better help them receive help they can potentially get so they don't wound up like myself. <laughs> 
Thanks very much indeed, Ryan. So you've heard from all four of our panellists today. Don't forget, you can use the Q&A function at the top of your screen to send us whatever question you'd like to ask. And we have got a start of a 10 question, which is very appropriate because we are celebrating our 10th anniversary as a company this weekend. So why not start off with a nice, easy one straight off the bat for you guys about what safer gambling means to you. And I've spoken already at this point to the fact that we've, we're celebrating Safer Gambling Week in the UK and across Europe. Not so much so in America, where PGAM in March dominates the agenda. So very interested to hear what that particular phrase, safe gambling, means to me. We'll start from the British perspective. Uh, Alan, if you go first on that one, please, just let us know what that phrase means in your mind. Oh, safer gambling. Thanks, AJ. And thanks for the, the question as well. Um, to me, you know, 10 years ago when I was just crawling and limping into recovery, um, it didn't that 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 saying that phrase wouldn't have resonated with me when I mean anything because I was past the point of prevention. I'd crossed and from prevention into harm. So safer gambling now safer um, gambling week means quite a bit to me now because it involves a lot of the work and the consultancy that we do with the operators. So it means a lot of it is down to education. It means keeping people in a safer place. It means um, all. It, it means everything to do with prevention. Um, that is what primarily we're involved in. Uh, we're not involved in recovery. There's a, a load of you know really good organisations out there, um, but it's stopping people getting to that cliff edge. Um, it's stopping people, whether that's by uh, being more aware of the time that they're spending online, or being more aware of you know a betting shop that they could be standing in. Um, it's just highlighting that stuff and um, also sort of educating the operators through lived experience uh, where um, you know gambling addiction or gambling disordered gambling can take you, uh, and it gives them a unique insight into some of those red flags that might not be the obvious ones. Um, so safer gambling to me really means education, uh, if I can put it to that. Fantastic. I keep it this side of the Atlantic asking Craig your thoughts. Do any contradictions to that or do you largely agree with Alan's assessment there? No, I don't think that you could have a contradiction to it really. It's quite a fluid thing, I think, my perception of it or my my you know belief behind it it's quite a loaded term i think safer gambling depending on which part of the of the industry that you're looking from i think people lose sight of it to be honest to me it means common sense i've been i've been in quite a lot of different industries um in my career of uh, of employment and i've just come off the back of a call this afternoon actually with with over 200 um 200 uh, attendees on it and we i was asked a very similar question and if i'm honest i think it changes every time i'm asked it it, it can be sustainability it can be um you know like as i say common sense commerciality as long as i think the key is the only way we get any progress in it and within two years of my working at epic just coming up to two years there's been an awful lot of work not only done but progress made Everyone needs to look in the same direction. And I think from that, I don't think anybody would want to be told you're doing anything unsafe. I think that the nuance of language sometimes comes into it. But the one thing, and I certainly certainly speaking for myself, is that the work that we do within the industry pillar is we see an awful lot of very enthusiastic, very committed people who we, if you'd asked either Alan or I, we speak an awful lot about this sort of thing. When we were in our troublesome t time of gambling, you know, whether it was right at the end of the period or even halfway through, we just didn't believe that this work was going on. To a certain extent, it wasn't. And it's uh, the fact that it is now, um, not just by Epic, by a number of other very good organisations, it means to me, I think it's hope almost, it's optimism, that it's, you know, it's never going to be completely ruled out. It's never, there'll always be somebody needs that little bit more help. But if we all work together, we're certainly getting better at it. Fantastic response to you there, Craig. Yeah, you mentioned about the nuance of language, and that's something that's going to be very important throughout this course of today with the, having a transatlantic panel here, because ultimately we know the phrase safer gambling isn't something that's quite as prevalent, if at all, in the United States. So if I could ask Ryan, followed by Patrick, to give their thoughts as well. You obviously got some very different terminology potentially for, the, for roughly the same thing, or is there a big difference? That's explained to the initiated here, Ryan. You know, I don't I don't think there you know is a big difference. Obviously, um, you know, Patrick and I are working in a little bit of a different sector. You know, we are forward facing with 18 to 23 year olds. Right. And so a lot of the people that we are speaking with don't even understand what their relationship um, with gambling is. And so I think kind of where our mission is and what we're doing is 
to help these young people identify, especially as more states are coming live with legalized sports betting, of what their relationship looks like with gambling and how to identify when things are a problematic relationship, much like you would do with alcohol or some other things as well. And so, you know, for us, I think education is, is spot on because again, we were all 18 to 23 and we just kind of did things willy nilly, um, you know, so to speak. But, you know, for us, you know, a big part of, of our education process, not only, um, you know, I can speak for myself and, you know, it's telling these young people that I didn't understand what my relationship looked like. I just thought I could control it the entire time and I didn't realize it controlled me. And so, you know, if we can help these young people just realize what the harmful signs are what the problem signs could be maybe they could take a step back and say hold on a second here this isn't what i want this to be and i need to to do some self-reflection so if you want to come in here patrick i'm just to hear your thoughts too on this yeah yeah thanks adrian it's similar to what ryan said like over here in the u.s you know 18 to 23 year olds which is you know primarily who we work with they don't know what they don't know right and I didn't either. So to me, it's at that age, it's about education. It's about awareness. It's about, hey, this is what the other side looks like. And here are some resources. Here are some some, some things you can look out for, whether it's you, whether it's a, a family member. And, you know, a lot of times I'll stress too, when I'm in front of female student athletes or female coaches and staff, the, the, the common thought over here is that, well, this is just something that, that guys deal with, right? Well, yeah, maybe 90 to 95 percent of the people that are betting on sports and gambling might be guys, but you may have a father, you may have a brother, you may have an uncle, a boyfriend. And so it's about just, again, letting them know what the other side of this looks like. You know, we're bombarded with ads during games over here about how fun this is, how great gambling is, but they don't they don't show you the other side of it. So like Ryan said, you know, to be able to share our experience and and, and give them some some tools, right, to go, to work with going forward to recognize some some triggers and some some possible warning signs that's what it's about to me that's again just just thinking about the that phrase of terminology that was craig mentioned before in the wider us marketplace does the phrase safe gambling have mean lots of people or is it really is, is responsible gaming still the number one term that you think people would, would classify as being the recognizable go-to term to describe what we're all to make this afternoon Go ahead. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, over here, it's it's responsible gambling, right? I mean, it's, you know, so essentially, it's just, you know, we're talking about the same thing, but it's, 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 that's what we hear over here, you know, and, and we're new at this, you know, we're, we're approaching 40 states now in the last however many years that have legalized sports betting, whereas over in the UK and over, you know, across the, across the pond, you guys have been doing this for a lot longer than we have. You know, so we're, you know, we're just trying to catch up. The train has left the station. We're just trying to figure out how to, how to catch up to it. And it says of those two phrases, anyone of you can pick up on this. Can you give, give like a, your own crazy, is there a subtle difference in, in the meaning for those who are trying to understand a bit more about this line of work? To me, there isn't. There isn't. And and I know it's, Alan knows my viewpoint on this. You know, we, we speak about it at length. To me, it's semantics, you know. It, it, it really, I think an awful lot of the time in this industry, particularly whether it's in the third sector or whether it's in, in, in service industries, there seems to be an awful lot of energy put into things that don't really need it. You know, if, if the same amount of energy was put into the work that I know certainly we do at Epic and, and we all share, particularly in the lived experience sector of it, then progress would have been quicker. I think the example that Patrick makes in the US, um, I've had a little bit of, of, of dealings with the guys at a couple of conferences this year across there is they've got a great footprint to learn from because we did it so badly. You know, the, the, the terminology that Patrick used there, that the train's already left the station. It's only at the first stop, I think, in the US. We're still chasing it down the tracks. So if people spent more time as, I, I do believe the progress is being made and that we are trying to do it more um, cohesively, you know, rather than hearing so many dissenting voices, it can be frustrating. It is something that we, we are very passionate about in our team because we do work with the industry um, and we see how much good work is being done, you know. Fantastic. Right. We'll keep rolling through the various eclectic mix of questions that are coming our way. Now, the first question to ask, I'll start with Alan for this one. Uh, did any of you use any of the tools or skills that you now teach on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm. 
Uh, I I wasn't a great question. Um, I wasn't aware of any tools. You know, this was when, you know, 10 years ago, there was no well-being chat. You never got that chat. Nobody called me up and asked me about the, the time I was spending um, in the betting shop or latterly online. Um, there were sort of subtle cues when I was in the betting shop. You might get... Because you build when you're in a betting shop, you build sort of you know relationships with people that are that are in the shop that work in the shop, and a few times they would maybe um, say to me, "Oh, is, is, is your wife not get your dinner? Is your wife get your dinner ready? Maybe you should be maybe you should be you know going home at this point. Maybe you should be going up the road, which means going home in Scotland. And um, maybe you should be going up the road." Uh, and I just completely ignored it because it was way past prevention. It was into pathological gambling disorder. So I never used any to, and to be honest, those tools weren't weren't available when I was. You've got things now like deposit curfews, you know, max state limits, and um, deposit limits, net loss limits, uh, all of these things. None of those were available when I was, you know, when I was out there gambling. It was just, especially online, it was just coming to the point of a lot of operators where they were just starting to explore that kind of thing. Uh, but I never, uh, sadly, I never, unfortunately, I never get the, the the use of any of the any of the tools. Um, so no, I never use I never use one tool that was that was out there because they simply weren't available. Yeah, can anybody else attest to that? Or if not, I've got I've got a very same, similar same for me, there. Adrian. Same for me. The time span's a little bit shorter for me, so it's only just over six years um, and a few weeks since my last bet. But the only contact that I had with any of my, um, the main operator who I was doing most, the majority of my gambling online with, was when I approached them directly, messaging them through Twitter um, to to ask for a profit and loss on my account. And even then I was almost, not subverted, but they were, I, was, I was asked whether I wanted to be self-excluded from all of the products or st when also then told to be aware that there was a free product on their site that I would I wouldn't be allowed to use and it almost made us think about using it um, and, and keeping it which would have undoubtedly carried on my gambling the one thing I would add to that though in terms of neither Alan or I or as far as I'm aware any certainly in the UK any of our um, lived experience had any contact whether it's a web chat um, a web chat an email a well-being call the one thing Alan and I can both attest to is they work now because we hear that we do QA um, Alan's up, up, as far as I believe the only lived experience QA analyst in the world um, doing work for one of the major operators and every month we listen to Alan does it much more than I do we often share the load and, and, and share particularly good calls we hear agents using the tools and, and representing the tools with skills that we've um, we've we've sort of trained out to them or recommended to them and there's little more satisfaction than when we sit at the other end of the country listening to calls and listening to people being helped because of the fact of them. It's um, it, it, it's incredible. I'll, I'll bring that across to you, you too as well. Patrick, any thoughts on that question? You know, I just, you know, I can I can think back to, to, to my time, you know, I call it the dark days, right? When I when I was I was I wasn't aware of, of of anything really at that point. I didn't know there were tools. I didn't even know what I was dealing with, right? I just knew I was making really poor choices and had no idea who to reach out to. Um, I was betting primarily through offshore accounts and bookies, right, uh, in, in Las Vegas. I wasn't necessarily going to a casino um, and betting that way. You know, but I just, I wasn't aware of anything. I just thought I was... Um, I was the only one that was dealing with this. And so that's why I feel like having the opportunity to do what we do now is 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 so rewarding because I I wish somebody would have um shared some of this knowledge and 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 some of these tools with me back then. Um because I think things may have turned out much differently. I think at this point it's worth bringing in a, another question from the audience here which is comes from Jez. Thanks for sending through Jez who says as an operator, we will try our best to advise the use of safe gambling tools to prevent excessive play. As a pathological problem gambler, would safe gambling tools actually help you stay in control or is cold turkey the best option? Uh, I'll let you come in at this point, Ryan. Any, any thoughts on that, that question there about the tools at hand versus the cold turkey option? I think it's where you, you know, where you are in terms of your gambling, right? You know, there was a point in my gambling um, that, you you could have put me in a psychiatric hole. My my one phone call would have been to my bookie. I mean, there was just nothing that you were gonna you were going to do that was going to stop me. 
Um, you know, but as I was continuing, you know, it may be in the beginning of my journey of when I was still trying to figure out what gambling was, if I had these tools available, absolutely. If I, if I had stop losses, um, you know, if I had different things and, and I know Alan and, and Craig can speak about it, you know, more so on the operator's side, but, you know, I definitely think that there's a point in time in, in everyone's journey where tools would 100% help. But I also do think there's a time and I'm speaking, you know, just for, for myself that, there was just nothing you could have done at a point in my journey that was going to stop me, you know, from gambling. And so I think again, too, that's where the education aspect comes in um, and, and listening to the, to the phone calls and things like that of helping, you know, operators identify maybe where a person is at in their gambling journey to then does is cold Turkey the best option, or is it a tool that we can potentially help that person continue to still make this fun on all that kind of, Craig and, and Alan, you know, chimed in a little bit on that since they work more with the operators. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that was a good answer, uh, Ryan. And just to sort of give people on the call a, a kind of deeper insight to some of the consultancy work that we do, Craig touched on it. So every month um, I will get sent operator calls and the operator has their own internal QA sort of, um, sort of process where, you know, certain things will be measured on. That call, some of those calls will then go, go out to me um, and Craig listens to them as well for an external QA. Now, I've got to say, it's a really brave move to have your calls externally QA'd by someone that suffered um, gambling harm, gambling related harm. Um, and when we listen to these calls, the calls are always evaluated with the, the same overriding thing in mind. Is this customer being kept in a safe place? or an unsafe place due to the interactions of the operator analyst. And some of the calls I have heard, just to back up the gambling tools, I have listened to calls where gambling tools have absolutely made a difference. Um, I listened to a call not long ago where uh, the operator, it's not just about the tools as well, um, you know, just going back to myself for a moment, all I ever really wanted was someone that would speak to me with a little bit of empathy. Um, and I might have opened up, but, you know, a call we listened to recently, um, the analyst stayed on the line with the customer and I, I actually got to the point where I heard the police busting in the back door and getting the guy because he was suicidal. Uh, and just the call was handled like it, it was just gold dust, the way the analyst um, sort of handled that call. You know, not to blow our own trumpet too much, but you know, we've trained a lot of these teams with um, our interactions masterclass that teach out the techniques um, and to sort of provide the insight that we know works. We know what you can say to someone that might be on the road to addiction and we know what not to say. And it's all about that empathy, that tone. We've got superpower questions um, and loads of different techniques. So, uh, and we know that the, the operator really values the external QE as well uh, because it lets them know and gives a bit of value to, to the, the safer gambling departments because there are safer gambling departments out there. You'll never read about them. You'll, you'll never, you're never going to pick up a paper or go into the internet and read safer gambling department saves females' life. It's kind of always the other stuff you will hear. But I can assure you there are um, analysts in safer gambling departments that really, really care about their job and they really care about pe keeping people in a, in a safe space. So it's it's a, the QA is something that um, we do as part of a consultancy. Um, we get loads of value from it. The operator gets loads of value from it, and more importantly, it's keeping customers in a safer place. That's it. Um, just on on a similar point here, um, Alan, I've got a question from Stephen. Thanks for asking us. Um, what's the are you QAing how well the chat script uh, topic can tag problem gamblers in terms of like picking up on? I can mean by this regular questions or regular soundbites you hear that help identify people in that situation. Yeah, I mean the the, the conversations. Um, there used to be a day when uh, a safer gambling call was quite scripted. Uh, there was a list of questions you would ask. It was almost tick box. It's not like that now. Not the calls I listen to. Um, the calls can go right off script. They can go right off topic. The calls can last as long as they need to last um, until you get to a place where. You know, that operator, you, you are starting to talk about a tool uh, and stuff. So there are more red flags now. You know, I think there's some like 20, 60, 30 markers of harm. And the analyst is always listening out for these. So conversations can go, um, as I say, they used to be quite scripted, but it's it, it's not like that now. Uh, there, there are, you know, we're now uh, into affordability 
type of, uh, you know, there's a part in these calls where it's a bit of affordability, you know, and those can be deemed sometimes as intrusive, you know, what are you asking me that for? You know, how much do I earn? You know, what's my disposable income? Well, you can't just ask those questions straight off the bat. You have to build up that rapport. Uh, you have to look at the customer circumstances. So it's all of this stuff um, that you, you have to look at to get that whole sort of 360 degree view of that um, of that customer. Um, you know, it's one thing having the data and the guy, you know, the people that, that the analysts, they have all the data in the world. They can tell you when you, you know, when your betting pattern was, if you bet late at night, how much you're betting, how frequent it is. It's not enough. You've got to marry that up with a conversation and then you might be getting somewhere. Um, so, yeah, good question, though. Great question. It is. Uh, also, also, but I'll come to Craig with this one. We, we've heard a number of examples of the sort of things that we're doing in conjunction with third parties to try and reduce the harm where it's taking place. Um, we've been asked, do you think operators need to be more proactive in identifying problem gamblers? So we just heard some examples of how that's perhaps taking place. Um, interesting um, question on I'm sure multiple, multiple levels this question, Craig, I'm sure. Yeah, great. It absolutely does. Great question. I mean, you could argue that they already are being proactive, but they can always do more. You know, it's and it's. I think it's part of my personality that it's, there's always more to come. Doesn't matter what you're doing, isn't it? You can always do a little bit better. Um, personally, I've never been a fan of pe people telling us what I do well. I'd rather know what I don't do well, and it's um, that's certainly the feeling that I get in I, that in, in in our role, Alan and I's role, is that every trip we do, every consultancy that we do, um, every challenge that we get makes us a little bit better at our job which in turn then makes us better at, at recommending challenging things in in the in the safer climbing space i think it's sometimes lost and it and it's almost scared a bit a little to mention about the, the commerciality side of it it sustainability was a part of my job that i didn't quite understand when i first took my role over i used to think that's nothing to do with me all i'm here is forced to save the world is to try and you know stop as many people getting into gambling problems as i did but it was something that was brought up today and I'm lost to the gambling industry. I've hopefully got, I mean, this might be, a, I might not be very good at maths, but I must have about 30 years left, possibly. I'd like to think, had I been looked after or had I, these tools existed, had I been given the, the self-responsibility when I had my gambling problems, I would have still been able to have a bet. And I'm lost to the, to the industry forever, you know, so I think that can be something that should be recognised that not only are we doing it because it's the right thing to do, there's a commercial reason to do it, to make sure that it's not just me who's lost to the industry, a number of my friends will never have a bet again because the scene, the, the darkness that I got in, that I went to, the levels that I dropped to. So I think it's, it's, it's fine to say that, but a long-winded way of answering the question, yes, of course more can be done. My feeling on it is... Um, and I've done and I've done this. I've shared the land, the sort of the land-based space as another market that I will look, that we're looking to go into at the moment. There's so many nuances of it. It's okay to say that we're all in it to to keep the industry still thriving because that's what we would all need. But it's um, yeah, there's, there's always more to be done. You know, tomorrow's another day. Thanks, Craig. Just I'm very conscious that both uh, Patrick and Ryan, you work in a slightly different sector for the company over in the US, so. Maybe a bit harder for you to answer that question as to whether operators need to be more proactive and identify problem gamblers. But can you see signs where you are that um, in this very nascent sports market, as uh, the, the the laws and regulations change across the country, are you seeing signs that there is a proactivity to find people who may be at risk? Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, um, I, I definitely think that they are being proactive. I, I've joined Alan, um, you know, at doing some operator training here in the United States. And so I think, you know, we, we've talked about where the United States maybe look may look across the pond a little bit and say, hey, we see some things that are going on over there that like I think, as Craig said, you know, that the trains already left the station. We're chasing after it. Maybe we can jump out ahead of this a little bit. And so, you know, I, I've I've been a part of of a couple classes here, um, you know, with the operators and, and things like that. And they are definitely trying to get out ahead of things again. Could could more be done? Absolutely. Um, you know, Going state by state, I think it, you know, every every state is is up to their own interpretation of the law and and what they should and and, and can be doing. And so, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, it, it's everyone's kind of waiting to see who's going to be the first person to do more, and, and then and then they'll go. Um, but I definitely think that they're trying to get out ahead of it. But I think Patrick put it best: is everybody doesn't know what they don't know. Yeah, it, it it's happened over in in England, but I think in the United States, we're just maybe waiting for that shoe to drop to say, okay, now we actually have to have to go do more here. Patrick, you want to, do you have anything? 
Am I missing the point? Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I agree with 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 what what you've all said. You know, um, we can use the UK as a as a as a pretty good case study for for us where we're at, right? I mean, we see what's happened over there. You know, and but I also do see um, a willingness um, from the operators to 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 you know kind of embrace this side of it. You know, you know, get out ahead of this, and 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 there is a willingness um, from them to you know to focus on responsible gambling. It seems like you know, but again, it's just we're all learning as we go. <laughs> you know, and so it's. Um, I think, and Craig mentioned it too, you know, when Ryan and I go from colleges and, and speak with student athletes and coaches, at the end of each session, we have a um, a series of questions for them, which is which is great feedback for us and kind of lets us know what what's going on for, you know, what they're seeing, you know, and what we can do better and how we can, how, you know, areas we can improve and those sorts of things. So, um we're constantly learning, you know, and, and and taking whatever feedback we can get and applying that to, you know, to what we do going forward. That's I can't believe we're already about two thirds way through our time here. You've offered some fantastic insight for us here, and this, this is an interesting one. I'm going to have to ask all four of you this question. Um, so we'll start. We'll start with Craig, go to well, and then come back to yourself, Ryan and Patrick, and answering this one as a collective. Um, but it comes in saying, for those people that suffer from a gambling problem who work in the gambling industry. What is the best piece of advice you could offer them? Oh, great question. And it's something that we're aware of is, um, it's, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's endemic, but I think it's 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 very prevalent. It's something we address in the training that we do, um, and, and particularly in the UK industry, which is what we, Alan and I know best, is um, to be surrounded by people winning. You tend to notice them more than people losing. You know, to be to be on maybe not a great wage, to be under certain amounts of pressure. Um, we're very fortunate, and I'm not just saying this. We're fortunate with with the, the, either that where our our SLT makes sure that we only work with the best companies. But it's an awful lot of the the sort of EAP, EAPs that we see and the feedback that we get from customer from people who work in the industry is that there is support there. I still think there's a stigma attached to it to the point that people would almost be embarrassed to say that they've got an issue with something whilst you're surrounded by it when you're enveloped in it. I, I believe there's a similar link to it with lived experience. I still think there's a little bit of a stigma for ourselves who are all uh, gamblers in recovery and we spend an awful lot of time surrounded talking about gambling. And it's something Alan's led on within our company actually that we have a, um, a our own lived experience sort of think tank when we're away from work. I think that's something that can always be progressed um, the key that I've found with a lot of the work that we do with it, with the SGRG teams, however you want to call it, is that particularly in comparison to the rest of the business, there seems to be a very low attrition rate. It tends to be that once these teams get together, look, they could choose to work in anywhere else in this industry and still get similar sort of, if not more pay. But they tend to be quite caring and empathetic people, sometimes from the caring businesses previously to. And we need to value them. We need to keep that relationship there and to show that they are, you know, what their worth is. So it's a great question that. And if it's from somebody who has that issue currently or knows somebody do, please reach out to one of us. It's, it would be absolutely anonymous. And, you know, it's we've got 20 odd lived experience people from every walk of life within us now within Epic, as well as an awful lot of people with with, with other you know, professional experiences. So it's something that I think needs to keep being refreshed and F5, F5, to remember that that need to be someone to look after the teams who are doing this. Yep, absolutely. Um, listen, I've, I've had um, DMs on LinkedIn from professional people um, all the way, you know, all, all the way up the scale um, from people that have got gambling uh, disorder. And can you help me? Uh, you know, and it's it's one of the the industry one. All it takes is you know, industry analysts and um, immune from sort of the, the sort of global stuff we're all going through. All it takes is somebody's you know, I've seen it. Somebody's mortgage doubling due to interest rates. And if you're in a, a vulnerable space where you see people, maybe you're handling, I don't know, big winner calls or something, and you see somebody winning, you know, half a million quid, or you could say, do you know what? I fancy a piece of that. 
you know, that would that would sort me out. That would solve my problems. And if you have the type of um, personality that we, you know, the, the the lived experience on here does, then it wouldn't. It's not too much of a leap um, and a dart to think that that might become an attractive option. You're surrounded by odds constantly. You're surrounded by uh, different sporting events um, constantly. You know, you go home and it's there in your phone as well. It's there on adverts. So I think, and it is, Craig's right, it's one of the things that we uh, make sure that when we go and speak to industry is that protect yourself. You know, we always talk about putting your own oxygen mask on before anybody else. You're in a highly vulnerable space. It's not, you know, it's not easy. Um, so it's something that we, um, we endorse, and it's something as well that we are going to get even deeper into um, in 2024. Our programmes are always evolving um, and a lot of that will be, there'll, there'll be quite a chunk of that dedicated to um, industry um, sort of analysts and their, their protection as well. So, um, yeah, good question, man. I'll come see you, Bess Ryan, if you want to add your thoughts to that. Yeah, um, you know, the, the best piece of advice that I give, and, and it's the advice that I didn't follow myself, is is be truthful, um, you know, with your feelings on on things, you know, with gambling. For me, I, I wasn't truthful with myself. I would tell myself lies every day that, oh, that doesn't bother me, or I could control that, or I could go do this, but not that. And that's not the hardest thing in the world for me. And it took me 18 years to do is to be truthful about what my relationship or how certain things made me feel, um, you know, with gambling. And I And I think that's just a human thing. And so, you know, obviously people that work in the industry, I think Alan, um, you know, hit on it. Well, if someone wins a jackpot or certain things happen, you know, that's going to trigger something in, in anyone's brain going, I, I want a piece of that. But if you're truthful with yourself and going, Oh, Hey, me, maybe me thinking certain things or me wanting to go off and, and, and place a couple dollars, you know, on a bet, that's probably not the right way to be thinking here. I need to go have a conversation and not just slough it off and say, eh, not a big deal. Um, I, again, can speak for myself and say that's kind of what I told myself for 18 years, that it wasn't a big deal. And I got to where I was. So I think, you know, being introspective with yourself and, and being truthful with yourself about how do certain things make me feel inside of the industry, whether it's winning, losing calls, things like that, and having someone you can talk to would be extremely helpful. And so one final piece of advice, please, for me, Patrick, for anyone who's in the, the gambling industry themselves and uh, is experiencing their own problem gambling. Yeah, you know, I, I real quick, I, I just think, you know, in that environment that Alan kind of touched on it, right? That can be rather intoxicating, especially if, you know, you're you're somebody who's 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 prone or addiction runs in your family. And if you're in that environment, you know, th the only piece of the best piece of advice it, which which is something I didn't do was just to say something to somebody, you know, like Ryan, like Ryan mentioned, it's it can be really difficult in our brains. The brains of problem gamblers are really. Um, huh, it's a funny thing because we can convince ourselves of just about anything. And so the, the hardest thing sometimes is just to, to take that step and reach out and say, hey, I'm struggling. Um, I don't know if I can get a handle on this. And that's the first step. And again, it's it's something that's really hard and really difficult to do, but. That would be the one piece of advice that I would I would have. I says all of you can probably attest to the fact that it is that reaching out that first that first admission is probably one of the hardest things you can do, and probably the reason why this can affect people for such a long period of time. So um, this, this links into a, a question from Kieran in the chat, um, which you know, I'm not sure I open difficult ones here. But it says when the panel speak about gambling, it does appear the sentiment is geared heavily towards sports book wagering. And just, so he's just keen to understand where you collectively aware that there have been gambling tools available for well over 15 years on other verticals. Now, I think this perhaps comes back to that Ryan made earlier that uh, you know, there may well have been tools there. It's just sometimes when you're in the grip of this, it's not always easy to look out for them. So to what extent were you aware that there could have been something you could have done at the time? Yeah, I mean, I, I can answer. You know, I myself, um, I was a casino gambler to start off with because when I when I played sports, we weren't betting on sports. And so it, it was an interaction with me to go play craps and blackjack and things like that. And I was aware of the self-exclusion pro or, you know, that you could self-exclude from a casino and, and things like that. I just wasn't truthful with myself about what my relationship with gambling looked like. I didn't think I had a problem. I didn't think that those tools were for me. It was a social aspect or it was a way that I hung out with my friends. And so I, I was aware of them personally, but 
again, I, I wasn't truthful with myself about what my relationship with gambling looked like or how bad it was. It was like, I can control it myself. It's it's not that big of a deal. And so I, I think if I was more truthful and, and maybe or had somebody and I could, that I could talk to and open up to and say, hey, this is a problem for you. I may have used them, but I was kind of left to my own vice. And as Patrick said, we can convince ourselves of anything. And I was very good at convincing myself that I didn't have a problem. <laughs> If I can just put that over to, to one of either Craig or Alan, who wants to jump in first, just give us the UK perspective on that particular question about um, to what extent you knew the tools may have existed on the first calls you were using, but did you want to overlook them willingly or otherwise? It surprises me actually that that, that um, and about Akiran's superior knowledge. I was a gambler 15 years ago, not someone in the industry. And it, if you if you'd asked me how long ago it was that they were available, I would have said 10 years maximum. Admittedly, 15 years ago, I was a responsible gambler or whatever term you wanted to be. So they were pretty irrelevant to me. My point would be that that's the time I should have known about them. That's the time it should have been normal. It should have been in every bookie I went in. It should have been on every app as I started to go onto it. It shouldn't be something that by the time I realized they were there, it's too late because I can't use them anymore. It's, it's, you know, the equivalence of we use the analogy and it is a little bit childish almost of when seat belts were brought in in this country, it was only in the 70s and the late 70s, there were still people marching on the streets with placards saying, I'm not going to wear a seatbelt. What right do you have to tell me? That still happens today. You can't help those people. We're not we're not advocating that everybody should be told what to do. That's quite the opposite. But nobody gets in a car today without putting a seatbelt on. We put them on our dogs when we put them in cars now. <laughs> and so I think it is just goes down to education. It goes down to normalization. It's conversation, not interrogation, is the key that we try to go through, is to make people feel they're not being told they're doing something wrong. We want to keep you as a customer longer because we're a business. That's how businesses run. But we want you to do it sustainably, enjoyably, and without it creating the harm and the devastation that I did for, for numerous, numerous people. Forget about me. I caused those problems to myself. But the numbers of people that for the rest of my life I'll have still caused problems to, they could have been helped, you know. Indeed. So it's been a very interesting chat so far. So they've got just under five minutes or so to go of our time. And we have been looking back a lot, um, working, looking at how things have evolved, particularly because, as I mentioned at the start of this webinar, we are celebrating 10 years as of this weekend as an organisation here at Epic, and we do want to look ahead to the future as well. And something that's very much part of the future is AI. And I thank Stephen for asking us the question, uh, is AI fit for purpose to pick up problem gamblers? Um, I know we, we were discussing before this as well, there was, there was a, a question we got offline as well, whether AI is a threat to your roles. So uh, I'll, I'll ask you a two-part question there. Stephen's point on whether AI can be fit for purpose to pick up problem gambling, and also uh, whether you see AI ever replacing the type of work that you guys currently do. Uh, what a question that is. Um, I I am going to say it's, I, I'm, of course I'm going to say it's not going to replace us, but I'll tell you why it's not going to replace, uh, because you always need human interaction. When I came into recovery, you could have sat the, the, be, the most advanced robot in the world in front of me, and it would not have understood me better than a fellow problem gambler that's been through it. The insights that can be provided by lived experience, um, humans are, you know, it, it's it's un, you know, it's it's unmatched. And I suppose you could get an AI uh, sort of robot or whatever or person. You could generate an AI person to to give lived experience. But if you know that that's not real, I I wouldn't listen to it. Uh, personally, I couldn't. I, I couldn't do that. Uh, give me the real deal. Give me the real McCoy. Um, I'll listen to that uh, because that person has emotion. That person has feeling. And if I can identify with the emotion and the feeling, then you know, I know, I know, I'm, I'm the right path. As soon as you can elicit emotions from people, you, you you're on the same wavelength. Um, there are some really smart AI apps out there now, um, which are which are doing good things. And I think AI in the right hands is to be welcomed. Um, do I think it will replace um, the human interaction? Um, I, I don't. I just. I don't see it um, personally. I'll, I'll ask Craig on this because I'm very conscious that Safer Gambling team here at Epic does a lot of work uh, to to fuse human experience with the benefits of AI. So can you speak to how they perhaps could work in tandem? So you may never see one replacing the other, but certainly they can they can work as a team potentially. 
So it does. That's it. I do that now, or rather we as a, as a company do that now, and we work with the Great Danes, Mindway AI, um, who are now, in, I believe, in, in 40 different countries, and Rasmus would, would, would tell you better, or, or the team that they have there, and it's, of course, there's a place for it. You know, there's hundreds, millions of transactions happening as we've been on this call today, and it's just not possible for the human eye or the um, the number of, of, of teams of people that will be needed to be able to monitor them. So, of course, there is, and I currently... Um, I have a, um, a a consultation contract with one of our operators we deal with, which is I, as a lived experience, look over the data or algorithms of certain accounts. And at first, it was it was almost like make believe because I, I you need to be careful with it because I've just seen myself in most of them. So while the data would then just show you um, one certain thing, Alan talks about it brilliantly. It's all you can't one doesn't work without the other. So there'll, there will always be a place for it, and and long may it continue. I think the longer that these the the, the AI systems become more, uh, that you know they learn more. That's essentially what my role is to to teach this AI system more, which I still can't get my head around basically. Um, and the longer that that works, and the better it is. But wholeheartedly, and I loved Alan's example there, that. If you, if there's nobody beats the, 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 you know, the fact of somebody who has been there, we regularly sit on calls without looking at each other and we'll both lift our heads up at exactly the same time, whether it's an inflection on somebody's voice, whether it's a bit of hesitancy on how they've answered a question, how they've not answered a question, sometimes it's just as important. And that can't be taught, I'm afraid. It's, you'll have to put up with our ugly mugs a bit longer. <laughs> It's certainly a fascinating topic, and I'm conscious we could have a, a webinar of its own right talking about that subject, but I'm very conscious we are just about running over time now. So we'll, we'll ask one final question that hopefully can go around the entire panel. I'll, I'll start with Patrick, then to Ryan, then come back via Alan and Craig on this one. So um, just, just to conclude, I'm just to know, how do you find that your job helps your own recovery? It's a great question. You know, for me, one of the th I, I told myself when I first got into recovery that I never wanted to get over my skis. I never wanted to be complacent and think I've got this right. So when I'm able to get in front of a group of, of young student athletes or coaches or staff or whatever. And share my experience and give them some tools that keeps me engaged. Um, it keeps me grounded with my recovery. It's 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 therapeutic in many ways and and. I can tell you, I was just at a, a college last week delivering a session to some student athletes. And at the end of one of the sessions, a female basketball player came up to me with, te with tears in her eyes, gave me a hug and told me about how her older brother had tried to commit suicide twice because he has such a, a raging gambling problem. And there's no, um, there's no way to, to, to describe that feeling um, to somebody that hasn't been through it. You know, so the, it's, it's situations like that um that are that are um you know you just can't i, I just it, it, that's what keeps me engaged and that's why i do what i do now and i'm again grateful to have this opportunity ryan the floor is yours absolutely um you, you know patrick said it too um as as odd as it sounds i i don't ever want to forget what I did and, and or the harm that I caused because I would tend to think, you know, the history tends to repeat itself, right? If you forget kind of the things. And so kind of talking through my story, you know, I'm brought back to certain situations and, and as a reminder of the harm that, that I caused. And as Patrick said, if anything, it provides relief and, and a therapy for myself of just remembering the harm that this did thing caused that, although it hasn't happened yet, if there's ever a point in time where I would go, Oh, I got this thing covered. Now I I can potentially do it. No, I I need to be reminded of this harm that I had. And um, you know, again, you know, as, as Patrick said, you know, we we share to these young people, and it's incredible. You know, we get we have conversations of moms and dads and uncles and brothers and sisters, and you know that are um, possibly exper experiencing potential harm or, or didn't realize it in, until now until they they heard us talk, and that's. That's soothing. You know, we I do realize that, especially in the United States, the the number of ad addicted gamblers and things, that number is low, but it's growing. And, you know, but we're still if you help one people, if you help one person, you know, you I think we, we've done our job. I mean, if one person can turn around or, or go have a self-reflective moment back at home and go, 
man, that old guy on stage was crazy. I don't ever want to be like that. <laughs> then I, I, I've done my job and, and I, I've helped somebody and that's that's all I can ask for. Go for Sally, we'll let you have your final say. Um, Epic is an impact driven um, place. We, we, we deliver to, to deliver impact in education. And the impact gets gets felt internally. And every time we deliver a, a lived experience, it's different every single time. Uh, myself, Craig, um, Dave, who's other part of our team, Joe, uh, and also uh, Dan as well. We, you know, when we deliver, we always have a debrief. Epic are very good at looking after us, uh, and we recognise. You know, we're quite self-aware of uh, sometimes when you're telling your story, you can get really, you can get choked up. You can get emotional. Sometimes it comes out that comes out of nowhere, um, and that's basically you're reliving trauma quite a few times. Uh, but we're really self-aware of um, where we are as people. We're really self-aware of the help that's there um, if we need it. As I say, Epic's brilliant at sort of looking after us, and uh, and we as a team, as I say, for gambling team, we all look after each other. We check in. Um, daily with each other if, and if we need a hug we get a hug it helps it's like therapy you know it's almost like every time you you you, you give your story it's almost it's therapeutic it's like delivering a, delivering a therapy and I'm quite lucky as well you know I go to I go to Gamblers Anonymous every week as well so you know I get to see the people that's coming through the door these days with that same broken haunted look and it reminds me that do you know what it's still carnage out there for a lot of people um, and that's the recovery side of things. So I'm lucky that I get to live in, reco re live in recovery, but I'm really lucky that I get to work in prevention. Uh, and as I say, um, I think Craig will concur, but it's, um, it's it's really therapeutic for me personally. Yeah. Yeah, I think I can pick up a little bit of what everybody said, if I'm truthful. It's, um, it's an ongoing process, I think. It's every time, I, regardless of whatever session that we're on, whether I've shared my lived experience or not, I think it's irrelevant because it's my life. So it's not a case of that. It's a story to tell everything that's happened since then, post then, has been reflective of what's happened before it. Um, so it, it, it's it's like an ongoing process for me. Um, it, I think it needs to be monitored and be careful that it doesn't become everything, you know, that it, certainly from my point of view, that there has to be something else other than that. But the feedback and the uh, and the responses that we get, and I can say it without fear of contradiction, every single session that I've been involved in since I started two years ago, somebody has either waited to speak to us, messaged us afterwards, um, dropped us an email, dropped us at, at, you know, on Twitter, whatever it may be, or on LinkedIn, and I still can't oh. quite get over that. Because I think there's still awful, it took me an awful long time not to feel ashamed of everything that I've done. And I probably still am to a certain extent of little bits of it, a bit like how Patrick said, it's not, and, and Ryan also, and Al, to be fair. I don't really want to ever get rid of that. I don't want to be on easy street. I still need to remember because there was an awful lot of people damaged by what I did. The fact that I'm now working in the environment where there's hundreds of people across the earth trying to make sure there's there is a few you know there's more little little amount of people get damaged the way that i did is a joy to be in to be honest and i'm proud of the work that we all do i'm proud of the company we work for well i think that's an absolutely fantastic note to end on because uh, we have run past our 45 minute slot so i'm very grateful for all of you who joined us today to listen to this wonderful panel speak very honestly and from the heart about the work they do the, the past they've been through and obviously the hopes for the future as well in this particular sphere. So uh, for those of you who are very keen to know more about uh, what we do and the partners that we operate with do as well, please do keep a very close eye on Epic's social platforms and websites uh, during Safe Gambling Week. There's a particularly strong amount of content across our LinkedIn channels uh, if you want to take a look at that. So with thoughts from a lot of our team, uh, insight from some of our partners and, and lots, lots more besides as we continue to do whatever we can to make sure that we're playing our part in Safe Gambling and its future. So. A big thank you to all of you for joining us and we look forward to the next time we do this with you. Take care and speak soon. Thank you. Thanks everyone.